link in the chat as well. So uh, just one moment. Uh, so so um, what we, I'm going to do is just very quickly uh, run through with some case studies that are um, sort of forewarning. They are, I suppose, fairly arbitrary case studies. I've picked a few museums um, and trying to sort of start with ones that just use the image API and building up to some with more fully implemented um, versions of IIIF, but hopefully to give you a taste of how institutions are using this for real, uh, and then end with some of the more experimental experiments and fun section, uh, a lot of which I, I just blatantly copy from another talk that I frequently give called Fun with IIIF. So, and th those are to really show you some of the more, uh, maybe sometimes off the wall possibilities. So, Without further ado, here, let's launch into the case studies. Um, the first one is the uh, Clifford Still Museum. And in this case, they only use the IIIF image API, and those images are directly provided by their dams, which is Luna. Uh, and for this, when we worked with them a few years ago, we created uh, a custom Open Sea Dragon viewer for their collection object. So every collection object here has an embedded uh, viewer. You can see the plus and the minus full screen buttons that are familiar there. Uh, what it also has is a, a little eye icon there, which takes you into a, uh, what's called slow looking view. So I'll show a little video of this in action. So what we have here is when the user selects that, it basically goes into the full screen version of the uh, the viewer. And the idea is it moves very slowly around the painting. It zooms right in and then it starts to pan right around. And this is for, uh, in response to audience feedback, where it said a lot of their viewers are so go to their museum for contemplation. They like to just observe the artworks and to relax uh, without needing any interpretation, really. So next example we've got um, is the Ackland Museum. Uh, they use IIIF as part of something um, called the, the PET collection of uh, illustrations and uh, drawings. And um, for this, again, it's purely using the image API. In this case, we have some search results from their online collection. When you enter the viewer, you automatically go full screen and on the right hand side there what we've added is some image manipulation controls and these are not so much for the artwork itself but for alternate views so you see in the top left there's a selection we've got the image um, itself but you can also switch to the infrared version of it and here you can start to see some of the watermarks of the pages come through themselves so by adjusting then the, the zoom level you can zoom in on these and by adjusting the image sliders there, so things like the, the contrast and the brightness, uh, then you can make these clearer and these sort of hidden features of the image more visible as well. Uh, next up, a local example, uh, Brighton Hove Museum. So as a small museum, uh, but again, they have added the image and presentation APIs to their online collection. And in this case, they're also doing a, an experimental feature to allow visitors to create their own uh, zoomable stories based on collection um, objects. So uh, here's what it looks like, collection search results. When you click on each one, then actually, again, they've taken advantage of the, the work, the great work that's been done in creating standards compatible viewers, in this case, um, universal viewer. So to provide all of the features to view the um, high resolution scanned images. And up in the top left there, you can see there's a link there that says add to exhibit. If you click on this, you get taken to the exhibit system, which is um, created by a company called Menacene. And what that allows you to do is to add your own um, title and description to this, followed by selecting different regions of the image with annotations and overall then to move yourself into a viewer where 
you can click arrows there to move previous and next and move through this. So this exhibit system is one of uh, at least three that exist out there. There's um, another one is called Stories uh, with three eyes, uh, which we've created at CogApp that again has an editor and a viewer component. And there's also uh, another called Stroll View, uh, created by Saiga Digital um, from Germany. And again, these follow the very similar pattern. You're, you can use a triple IF image to create annotated stories about that image, which you can then embed within your own websites as well. And there's there's a few institutions around there using it. But as far as I know, uh, Brighton and Hope Museum is the only one that actually integrates it directly to their online collection. More examples, uh, and this time more fully featured the Victoria and Albert Museum use IIIF in lots of different ways. So they support image and presentation APIs for all their collection objects, but they also have lots of other features, including Im image overlays, annotated tours, slideshows, and so forth. Have a quick look at these. So here's an example of an image overlay with hotspots, regions of interest. And when you click on those, it will zoom you in and give you some interpreted text. And you can move around the painting like so. In this case, uh, it's the same kind of idea, but as an uh, interactive tour. So you click start tour and you get a uh, full screen view that moves you around and zooms in on salient points in the painting. This again, slightly different, uh, but you have regions of interest and you can click on those. You see annotations in this case with uh, not just text descriptions, but illustrative images as well. And then finally, in this one, this is an example of a slideshow. So clicking through with that arrow there on the right, embedded within the page, you see different supporting images and the, the tombstone, tombstone text to describe them. But it, as you go through the slideshow, it's also interactive. You can zoom right in and just see the, the full details of any of the objects that are featured. And then finally, here they are using um, Universal Viewer to uh, for all some paginated material in this case um, source notebooks uh, on to another example the John Paul Getty Trust uh, in this case they they support IIIF extremely extensively um, image and presentation API they use it for both their online collection and their research collections viewer as well as having developed and maintained a custom publication system called Quire so some examples of this, here is the online collection with a search term, uh, we can get some search results. And then on each page, there's an embedded viewer there. So I've zoomed in slightly on that. Um, what you can then do though, is also add these to uh, the comparative viewer, in this case, uh, Mirador 2. And in the, here I am, I've loaded up two different collection objects and I can do side-by-side -side comparisons. Uh, for their research collections, very similar, but in this case, their um, museum archives. And part of their archives are these uh, fantastic photographs dates from 1950s to present day of um, Sunset Boulevard uh, and thereabouts. And in this case, the, this interactive, they call 12 Sunsets, allows you to see all of these photographs um, overlaid on the actual route itself. They also maintain Choir, a, uh, a way of creating, easily creating online publications. So here's an example um, focusing on uh, carved amber. And you can see here, it, it follows the pattern of a uh, narrative text with embedded images. And again, those images being based on IIIF have the embedded viewer there. Uh, final example is the National Gallery of Art. And here again, um, very well supported. So both the image presentation API, and they're also using authentication API uh, to restrict access to the high uh, resolution viewers. In this case, um, provided by the NetX dams. And what they have is a comparison feature as well. So if we look at this, you can see the collection search results. And then as you go through, as you look at each one, there's this um, option, say, compare images. And when you click that, then you can see the ones that you've added to that comparison viewer directly side by side as well using Mirador. Uh, they also have this for their, their digital collections. 
and here you can see again embedded um, this in this case I believe that is uh, Mirador 3 being used uh, to see some of the um, digital collections there. So moving swiftly on to experiments and fun here's an example uh, from Art Institute Chicago when they really soon after they released their new API they released an example of how it can be used in this case uh, what they call Art Tab. So this is a Chrome plugin, which when you install it, every time you open a new tab, then it will give you a new artwork from the Institute. And if you click on that, it will take you through to the catalog record as well. So again, deliberately simple, but a way of using their triple Earth images. Here's an example from the Welcome Collection in London, uh, created by Digerati and it's the story quilt. So in this case, they had a physical object that was a, a sewn quilt. And what they are doing, if the video loads, um, is using an interactive viewer so that again, as you start your journey, it will zoom in and highlight individual panels of the quilt along with um, a description of what they represent. And as you move around, uh, the clever thing about this is it not only zooms, but it will also rotate the image as well so that everything you're looking at, although in reality it's all different orientations, uh, online it's as if you um, have tilted yourself around until they're there. You can also freely explore the, quest, uh, the quilt as well. Uh, this is an experimental project from uh, Jeff Stewart of Harvard Art Museums uh, using their triple IF uh, images as a source to create generative art. So we look at a quick clip of this in action. Uh, we'll see, I'm afraid, uh, Jeff, it, there's a longer version of this talk where Jeff explains this in detail. He's talking in the bottom right there. But for the moment, I'll just show you a quick clip. The idea is you can select regions from a source artwork, uh, one representing the trunk, others representing leaves. And then once you've selected those, we have this generative algorithm that will then make these grow into a whole forest of different trees, all created from different artworks. So you can see here, it's picking using entirely new artwork. And once that's added as well, then that tree will start to grow uh, bottom right there, unfortunately hidden by Jeff's head. There we go. Uh, next up, an example from the Getty. This was uh, Animal Crossing and here, they actually use their own triple IF images uh, to create, uh, again, de deliberately limited and pixelated images that can be imported into the Nintendo game Animal Crossing. So uh, in this interface, you can select on the uh, left-hand panel the area of the image that you want to feature. It will then show you the pixelated preview on the right and as you do so, it will regenerate the QR code that's necessary to scan to be able to import that into your Animal Crossing game. Uh, another project from Jeff Stewart um, from Harvard Art Museums, this time Super Collage. Uh, kind of similar idea to the other one, but in that you can use it, you start with selecting regions and then move forward to do other things with those. So, sorry, I'm going to uh, mute Jeff and hopefully we will see um, the results of this. That on the right-hand side, there's a panel of images you can select from. Once you select those on the left-hand side, you select the different regions. And this time, as soon as you finish selecting, it will automatically add those to a palette. So you're selecting some circles there, uh, some different shapes uh, and then from that palette you can then use these to create your own artworks as well. Uh, this is another one um, Ben Alberton from Stanford Mirrorama and this is taking digitized collections objects that are uh, Mirroramas. They are um, a Victorian thing where you had different panels that would combine together to build a landscape and in this case, we can use the magic of IIIF to regenerate lots of different ones. Uh, this project 3D Space Creator, created by my colleague Ian, 
um, for a collaborative hack day with the Science Museum and the b &A, uh, that we did a while ago. Um, for this, they had taken all their museum data and mapped it by similarity in an n-dimensional space. It was all very uh, exciting and a bit confusing. We decided to cheapen it all by turning it into an old-fashioned space-based video game. So here you can see uh, zooming around space through clusters of different collection objects. And as they hit the site, or, or reticule, as I believe it's called, then you can see that those get loaded up into the middle and display the collection data. Uh, and then if I want to, I can bookmark these and add them to the list up on the left hand side. Those will then link through to the full catalog records so that you can follow it up in your own time when you come out of space. And finally, uh, another project using the Art Institute Chicago, um, created by my colleague Matt. This is Art GIF. And what we have is a small uh, sort of canvas idea where on the left you have a, a artwork search. So you can um, select from a theme or you can type in a search term, in this case, coin. I've got a whole load of coins. Uh, and once you select an artwork, it gets moved into the editor in the middle, and you can zoom and pan that edit to create the crop you want, add it as a new frame, and then either continue working with the same object or switch objects. And once you've got a new frame, add that as well. And you see on the top right there, the output of this. So that is a pure, uh, simple animated GIF that you can then just right click and download and use for all your meme needs. Uh, so there we go. That was a while, uh, whirlwind tour of uh, some of the uses of IIIF in museums, um, starting with the uh, you know distinctly useful and uh, obvious ones that back up the museum's missions of uh, disseminating information about their collection objects, through to some of the, the crazier experiments, but it, that again hopefully demonstrate some of the potential of having uh, easy to use and reuse images in an interoperable fashion. Um, I did say questions, but I realized this has gone on longer than I thought. And I wonder maybe if we should move on to the um, implementers round table. So uh, may maybe if there are any quick questions, let's, let's have some. And if not, I'm gonna hand over to Matt for the next part. Thanks, uh, Tristan. So question about the slides. Uh, yes, I will. I'll put up these slides um, in the 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 Google Drive for this whole online event. I'll, I'll um, add them there after this talk. Um, and sorry, Mike, uh, your question is a list of museums. Uh, yes, indeed, there is. Um, so I think I've pasted this in at the beginning of the chat, uh, but I will do so again. And again, it would be fantastic if uh, if your institution or any institution that you know that uses Triple F is not listed there, please do add them um, and equally any other details about particular features that they use. Uh, and can we get the list up on the site? Uh, yes, that's a very good idea. Once, once I think it's been fleshed out a little more, I'll see if we can get it linked up directly from the museum's community group page on the site. Um, and then, yeah, it can be a living document and just added to as and when um, new museums start supporting things or existing museums add new features that are, are new or noteworthy. So uh, yeah, that's a great suggestion, thanks. So. I'm going to stop now and, and hand over to Matt to make sure that we have uh, enough time for the uh, Implementers Roundtable. Thank you. Thank you, Tristan. And <clears throat> I have to say, being relatively new to the IIIF community, um, I always look forward to your fun with IIIF portions and videos. Um, I've learned a lot through just fun with IIIF. So um, we shared a survey uh, earlier and on our community Slack group um, asking for responses. I'm just sharing my screen to um, look at 
some of your responses to four questions that we circulated. And the idea for this round table for implementers came from one of our community calls a few months ago where um, we were just kind of talking about barriers that we've all experienced uh, after one of our talks, um, either for implementing for the first time, especially at smaller institutions, or extending AAAF uh, to a, the next extent or moving to a newer API. Um, so really, we're just wondering what more the community, our community group can do for that and coming up with ideas for future talks uh, and calls. So um, this is a pretty new survey. And thank you, everyone who submitted something to this. And um, I'll just kind of go through these and then um, maybe pull out some threads. And Tristan, feel free to speak up anyone um, uh, from our co-chairs who has comments on this. Um, and one more thing before I start looking at these or we look at these together, um, there was one comment about being at a library or a special collections. And in my case at the National Gallery, we've really found IIIF to be um, living up to its mission to break down silos just within our institution across the museum and the library parts of our institution. So um, while we're calling this museums, um, there's a lot of special collections and library use cases, I think, that fit this really, really well, too. Um, so I think the main question that really got us thinking of this, again, was what barriers have you encountered in implementing or extending AAAF at your museum? Um, a few of these seem uh, familiar to a lot of you, time and technical skill. Um, and again, especially for smaller institutions, I'm lucky in my case to be at a large institution that has a lot of things in place that I can pick up and work with or continue to advance to break down silos, but um, implementing it for the first time. And I think that's one thing that's come up a lot in our community group that we can keep talking about. Um, so technical, not necessarily technical obstacles, but unfamiliar from curators communications and other content creation colleagues. So that's a big one. And um, another theme I think we've found at our community groups that when you present it to your museum, um, what clicks, what's a success story? And that kind of feeds into our next three questions. But again, maybe not technical obstacles, but communication and um, show offy bits that do or don't click in every situation. Um, reading through a few of these, yeah, staffing, of course, tools and dams. And I think for the nav police talk, you know, a theme there is just not having enough time to um, do demos, to really um, bring this to the community space. And um, I think I'm excited for where we can do more hosts for the museums group. Again, we're specialized for museums and museum implementers, but um, a lot of the things that have been presented here at the online meeting, I think would be great to demo more for our community as well. Um, so not to focus on barriers too much. And Tristan, if there's anything you wanted to highlight from here. Um, no, not really. I mean, I think I suggest maybe we just go through these in order, having having a look. And um, please, everybody, feel free to to chip in. Um, you know, if we as we discuss each one in turn. Okay, I'll keep going and um, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat as well. Um, this is one question I'd really like. Is there a moment where a AAAF enabled feature impressed your colleagues and that opened new pathways? Um, showing how to use a AAAF viewer to pull up comparenda from other institutions for works in our collection for research and then share that viewing panel with the rest of the curatorial team or with classes. Yeah, that's... Um, you know, comparisons, direct object comparisons is kind of the core of uh, art history in a sense, and um, doing that across collections in a way that, and this, you know, plugs and you can share those comparison views, one of those core use cases, I think, but it's such a powerful one and you can't really um, gloss that one over too much. Another one, yes, as a curator or a curator had installed Sea Dragon at home, uh, with your partner's help where, yeah, so um, helping someone like a curator to um, gain these skills, maybe do the five-day training course and start 
tinkering, playing with it themselves. I think um, I agree. That's very positive. Um, not yet. Got it. Uh, zoom and storytelling features. Yeah, the uh, kind of deep zooming and storytelling. Um, some of those three storytelling applications that Tristan showed um, have maybe not infinite possibilities, but they are really, really compelling. And I think intuitive to use and to tell stories in new ways. And as a researcher, in my case, I'm thinking more about how I write things about collections and how you can share those in those through those media. Um, definitely, absolutely. I link to cropped shots of ownership marks and seal impressions and Persian manuscripts in the provenance field. Okay, mm, that's interesting. Um, link to cropped shots of things like watermarks, ownership seals. That's amazing. Um, I'm going to keep going through these responses. Yes, the creation of a working AAAF based system for the documenting painting sample sites. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so this, I guess, you could qualify as an internal use, maybe with the potential for uh, public facing use too. I find those use cases really exciting where the kind of um, why you're drawing annotations, why you're adding um, descriptions of things for an internal and how that becomes part of your creative process in museums for later outward facing projects. I think Triple F um, has such a role to play in both of those. Um, and again, it's opening new pathways for new exhibitions, new ideas, the way you're going to approach that work. And also, yes, but it's short lived because of scholar focus. Yes. Um, as someone who's trained in academia as a PhD, I don't have great focus either. <laughs> uh, the fact that actually our licensing revenue features in academics were able to see our images more clearly. Okay. Um, I think, again, getting to deep zooming and um, the exposing collections and quality images in that way um, is itself, again, that pathway. I'm going to take a quick look at the chat again. Uh, thank you, Tristan, for those three links for the storytelling or scrolly telling, sometimes two examples. All right, I'll keep going to this question, I guess, slightly a negative one, but um, it's something in our community calls that I sensed was coming up that like, uh, beyond the technical barriers, are there just things that don't click when you when you explain them to a larger researcher or community curator group? And um, I think something we could do is just talk more about where we're finding those, and you could call them pressure points or pain points too, I guess. So if you report on initiatives, uh, which aspect do you fear talking about the most? Bold fear here, and that's that's my doing. It feels like we're at a stage where our next steps require larger time and labor inputs, <laughs> uh, but will be somewhat experimental, and that feels risky in the current climate. I'm not sure how to scaffold further steps. Well, scaffolding is a great term there, um, and uh, I do think demos play a part in that. Where you know, and again the fun and the demo aspect of things, even like Nav Place that I was just um, so impressed with the possibilities for it. Um, and making that not just another technical leap, but um, building in um, you know, the next steps to achieve those things and scaffolding. Um, how UV or Universal Viewer has a download button that is hard to get rid of and how to use manifest across several viewers. Mm. It's hard to explain to non-image technical colleagues. Right, um, and my personal response to that one is finding tools that help me gather manifests in a way that um, uh, makes, makes it very easy. Uh, Detective, I think, is one um, helpful browser extension that I use and I think a few colleagues use as a gathering manifests and then building your own. So I think that's a discoverability question. And here, for this response, focusing on universal viewer. Um, Sorted ones about fears for bringing AAAF initiatives to museum technical resource need. Um, uh, thanks, Julian, for that link for Detective. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, detect AAAF. Uh, 
not really. I'm glad to see there's people with no fear talking about AAA off too. Um, money and continual cost of infrastructure, okay? Yeah, which you know is a perennial thing um, that's never going to go away to some extent. But um, uh, okay, that's enough of the fear, I guess. And so going on to enjoy. Um, same question, but is there an aspect of Triple F you enjoy talking about at the most? Um, the way it seems to pop up as useful in so many small ways, different audiences, we've used it a little for curatorial research, but even more for small ad hoc coding projects, like bringing in image thumbnails for collections, assessment of classes using it for digital storytelling. And it's just smoothing workflows the way that we were doing anyway. And workflow is a word that seems to be in my head all the time now, perhaps being in a large institution where um, workflow is kind of the tangible aspect of scaffolding, perhaps. So um, I love this response because it has a lot of everything involved here. So small ad hoc coding projects um, down to web-based tools and apps for digital storytelling. And that once these resources are there, with enough demos and communication, you can show off so much with those tools. And I think in a nutshell, functionality is, is another response, um, endless functionality. And I, I agree, that's I enjoy talking about that. Uh, I'll keep reading through these. Um, yes, we're using the same digital assets to multiple ends, return on investment. Yeah, that has a kind of a business use case end to it. I agree, there is a return on investment. Robust open source community, um, huge. <laughs> I think that is really huge. And documentation, technical documentation as part of that open source community. Um, I've only learned the one thing, but I'm eager to learn more. Uh, yeah, and I think that's part of this open source community. Once you've learned one thing, it's easy to want to learn more and to find resources for that. Um, and again, speaking in the museum and library, world um it is often an open source world and the triple f corner of that is such a, a strong one uh all uh all of the really say it is good to be able to provide details of tools and solutions supported by good communities and the potential for commercial support for long-term sustainability that's interesting so um again beyond the learning one thing but there are long-term sustainability tip to tail, I guess. Um, and uh, our community for the museums group, I think, is one place where no matter what stage you're at, um, you can find help for those next implementation steps, scaffolding those next steps, or and, you know, um, getting the instruction for that first level. All right, I'm going to finish these two, and then I'll take a look at the chat. And Tristan, if there's something there, feel free to, to share it out, to speak out. Uh, last two, public response in using Triple F viewer embedded in a MOOC is very encouraging. Oh, that's interesting. So um, MOOCs being you know, massively online um, instruction courses, I'm not pronouncing that right, but you know what they are. And um, I think that kind of basic interactivity of a Zooming viewer uh, as something on a web page or something involved in a MOOC. I think um, uh, there's something to be said just for that interactiveness of zooming into something and dragging it around. And then what more can you do with that tool? And that personally was the first time I'd explored or discovered Triple off five years ago, um, thinking, how is this built? And um, this is so great. I can just move it around in this little viewer. Uh, the way in which it can open the collection to new global audiences. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I think that gets to discoverability for once museum objects are digitized, put online. And um, and maybe with the last one thing about embedded viewers and the digital objects there, um, 3D is another topic that's come up a lot and um, something that the museum community, I think, will increasingly be interested in. And um, we might think more about how 3D um, really addresses global audiences in particular, I think in future calls. Um, all right, so we've gone through all of these. Um, and Tristan, is there anything I'm asking you for the chat to call out? I don't think so. I mean, there have been some discussion. I, I guess my question would be, you know, is there any 
point the uh, this we we've obviously covered a lot of different responses there is there any point that anybody would like to discuss in more detail i mean in, anything anyone either really strongly agrees with or disagrees with um i'm you know i think that the chat has got some yeah there's some good points there about kind of tools tools that will maybe help to demystify and help people with the trickier technical aspects of well where do i find a manifest or what is the info.json so detect it detect triple if um is an excellent tool again it's a for those who don't know it's a a browser plugin that will find triple if images on the page and then um actually try to then track back and create the uh, find the, the source manifest you can also add multiple items and create your own triple IF collection and so forth so it's a it's a really nice way for to get non-technical users more familiar with the the core triple IF concept of images and manifests um as well as to be able to sort of uh, quickly create your own collections which is the you know, I found that's a fairly common use case is people see this and then go, but how would I create my own collection? And at that point, until now, there's been, uh, you know, no answer short of hand rolls and JSON or something. So no one wants that. So I think, uh, so maybe actually opening it up is, is there anything else anybody else would recommend to help to try to, to demystify or, or, allow non-technical people to get more involved with um using triple IF tools you know I'm thinking simple tasks like you know add add a new manifest to Mirador or something what what other things either tools or, or strategies have people found that will help others at your institutions to to be able to do that themselves I, I do have a question, if you wouldn't mind yeah, asking. Yeah, Frank, go ahead. Hi, guys. I'm glad you like the NAP voice viewer. Thanks for calling me out. Uh, so I plus one to non-technical people being able to do this stuff. Uh, I think in the community, in places like Commons, we try to think of interfaces where things like triple IF drag and drop make it easier for a person who's not technical to kind of go from thing to thing. Uh, but I actually had a question before you raised that point of do museums in general find it difficult to get access to a developer or to uh, or is it just too hard within the budget to get access to developers, I guess is my question is that a general sense of uh, is that a general problem that's in museums. I can't speak for all museums in any sense, you know, like any <laughs> institution, there's um, so many things that might need to happen for for that. I think it always starts from innovation and from coming up or sharing a demo, finding something that you want to do and, you know, your research question behind that. But right. the reusability of assets, I think, is maybe the strongest place to start with that once you have tens of thousands of digital object digital digital images to, to begin with and cataloging then um how are you exposing that so um right. i think it always kind of starts there and i i can't really you know say it since it's mostly for each institution if they have developers on, on staff or you know if they're looking to the open source community first but um yes. I, I, you're absolutely right. The the first meeting before I ever work on anything is with digital humanities, just so someone can explain the project and ask the questions. That is definitely where it starts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, curious. and so I just add from the digital humanities perspective. So often those types of projects are thematically bounded or chronologically bounded, yes, and then exactly. maybe they end up building some kind of architecture that they realize could be reused for lots of other things and that shift i think in the field is relatively recent that those really specific mm -hmm. tools aren't designed for a whole architecture but just exposing one corner of something or you know a particular viewer so um so i guess i don't to 
go big, zoom out a bit, that's kind of just the state of the fields, the state of museums and their digital humanities um, projects and programs. Yeah, I think that's a good read. So I'm zooming back up or scrolling back up in the chat. Um, there was a comment about discoverability. Uh, Julian was saying uh, he would encourage institutions to implement the change discovery API and then aggregators to retrieve AAAF resources that way. Um, and that's a big one. And as you know, speaking for non-technical people, I guess, in museums that um, change discovery in a sense explains itself, but um, I think that's uh, kind of a cataloging issue in a way, like if a museum recatalogs something, reattributes something and the metadata changes, maybe the image doesn't change, explaining why that's such a big deal and why um, that's such a big deal for discovery um, is another tricky thing to communicate across the technical to the, to the public. So, um, I definitely agree. And that's, that'd be an interesting thing to think more about, I think. Um, could I follow up on that and just ask, like, who, who are the aggregators? Because that's, it, you know, I've, I've seen the change discovery API, but I've always thought of it as something as a, a bit abstract and academic, because I don't know who really would use this. So it has, could someone let me know who you know who who is currently or plans to use it to retrieve things e either for your own institution or, or as um julian says about the about aggregators uh i could jump in again if you'd let me <laughs> yeah please do um i i don't know that it's a direct direct exact answer to your question but there are some little things uh, like I know Jeff Witt from Loyola and we from uh, St. Louis University have made, I double, double, my bad, um, uh, a linked data notification machine where you can register your resources with it and then it'll link data announce out your stuff, like when changes have happened. And then our applications listen for that and sort of decide whether or not to take the change. Uh, that's sort of one pipeline where like announcing a change and having something be discovered or letting it be known someone's accessing or using your resources is possible. Thanks, I clicked on the link. So that's what we're seeing here. Yes, we're in the box. And I'm sure we'll be aggregating all of these links from the chat as well. Yeah. And are, are there any, I mean, because when I think of aggregators, I think of people like, um, you know, the DPLA, uh, or Europeana or or similar are either of those using the change discovery API or, or similar to retrieve triple F images and and if not them then who Okay, I'll, yeah. Well, I, I, it remains an interest of mine. So, yeah, if if somebody if somebody does find out, um, yeah, I'd, I'd be keen to know. But should we should we move on to to another point? Um, so, I think somebody mentioned the the content search APIs uh, in the chat. Um, so, uh, was that? Uh, Mike, you you were saying, uh, do, you, do you want to say a bit about the you're planning a survey on that? Is that right? Uh, yeah. Sorry, Zoom Zoom did not like my microphone for a second there, but I think I'm coming through. Yes, you are. Uh, it was just a brief mention because I saw in the in the program discussion for this session it said we will discuss things like. Et cetera, et cetera, supporting search and authentication. Um, so it was just a, a, a sneaky plug, uh, to be honest, for the fact that the content search technical specification group will shortly be sending out a survey um, about current implementations of content search API uh, or people who desire to implement it 
uh, and we'd really value some feedback from the museums community um, because I think that this is a place where search actually could become very powerful. Um, although it's designed for searching the content of annotations, it can still form part of a discovery layer for IIIF services. Um, and the second part of that is we'll also soon be gathering some use cases for what could the content search API do that would help your uh, help your implementations of IIIF. Uh, so again, having some input from the museums community would be really valuable to us. So just keep your eyes peeled for, for those things coming up. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. That's that's great. And I mean, could I ask of the current participants, is anybody either using or thinking of using the content search API? And the, the, the reason I ask is that, you know, this is something that we've dealt with a few times at COGAP, but it's always been for archives rather than museums, because for, I think for archives, there's a very natural map of annotations on an image to being the actual transcription of printed or handwritten pages, whereas for museums, where often the, the, the images involved are either things like representations of a painting or photographs of a three-dimensional object, then to my mind, there's a less clear need for an annotation there. So um, is, is anybody, uh, has anybody used content search or is anybody thinking of it? Okay, so it sounds like Mike, you may not have many respondents for your survey, but it's well, or, or even okay. negative use cases, I suppose, of something saying we have no need of this. Um, yeah, that's, that's also a very valid response of saying it for the workflow we have for the, the the objects we're presenting. Search does not add anything. So part of my thinking, especially around the use cases thing, is um, there are potential uh, things that I think could apply for non-text-based collections. Uh, so you're right, I think the majority of existing implementations of search are for large documents where you have a transcription and you want to search it. Um, but for example, when I was still at Edinburgh, uh, we started playing around with kind of having annotations that tagged objects inside paintings. And so then you could search, you know, you could say, show me all paintings that contain a dog. Uh, using the content search API based on the fact that oh, there's an annotation on this painting that says, hey, look, this object at this coordinate is a dog. So that was my thinking of uh, how it might apply for more museum based. That's yeah, that's a very that's a very good point. And I know there's there's certainly some museums have at least been experimenting with um so computer vision to automatically generate tags and labels for images um that could then be your you're right the the output so either created manually uh by curators and so forth or um by computer vision to effectively provide those descriptions of features within a painting or photograph so yeah uh i stand corrected that that, that, that does sound like uh, an obvious use case for that for the annotations and, and therefore annotation search thanks i just want to jump in to say i realize we're kind of over time a minute uh, so we everyone has that 10 minute break but um uh, david newbury said that in the chat that the tension tends to be that museums for museums triple if is not nearly as close a proxy for the object as it is for libraries or archives i think that's a great great point and one maybe overlap is how alternative texts or if museums are writing alt texts for screen readers and things like that, how those could be a kind of middle space, like they describe uh, an object or an image in a certain way, but um, are they annotations? Would they make sense as annotations? Not really, but um, I think that'd be an interesting topic also for a future call. Um, and since I called to the clock, I'll just use a, one more minute to say that we have upcoming community group meetings, January 10th and February 14th. Um, one of our ongoing themes is um, museums and natural history, and not just art museums. And um, so we'll have a, uh, Roger Hyam talking about um, biodiversity art, sorry, talking about uh, 
work they're doing at the Royal Botanical Garden. Um, thanks, Emmanuel, for the link to the museums group. So I'll stop there and thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you to Matthew and Tristan for that. That was a really appealing showcase. And there were a lot of um, resources that have, um, I have tried to the best of my ability to um, put in the online meeting channel in Slack, but all of this will be recorded. So we only have about seven minutes until our next session, which will be um, in session with the executive committee as they go over the strategic plan. And you will all also have an opportunity to discuss that and give feedback. So we will see you all back here in seven minutes.